Hello there, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now, one of the most important components on a system on a chip, besides the CPU, is the GPU, the graphics processing unit. Now, for some people, the GPU is shrouded in mystery. How does it work? What does it do? Well, let me explain. Okay, at the simplest, lowest level, a GPU is a clever piece of hardware that's very good at certain type of mathematical operations. In 3D graphics, everything is made up of triangles, lots and lots of small triangles that are built together to make complicated models. Now, as you know, a triangle has three corners, three points. Now, each one of those points is called a vertex, and it has a coordinate in the X and the Y and the Z dimension. So one of the things that happens in 3D graphics is those vertexes need to be processed. For example, they might need to be moved from one place to another place, and that's called a translation. Maybe it needs to be scaled to be bigger or to be smaller, and of course it can be rotated. Now these three basic operations are called a transformation. It turns out in 3D graphics that the best way to express this X, Y, Z coordinates is using a vector. And if you want to perform a transformation on a vector, you can multiply it by a special matrix, a special four by four matrix. Now these matrices all have different properties. You can do scaling and trans translation and rotation just using a particular predefined matrix. Therefore, a GPU needs to be really good at matrix operations. In fact, it needs to be good at vector operations, floating point operations, and matrix multiplication. Now, in the old days, a GPU had a fairly fixed uh, pipeline, a fairly fixed process. So your 3D graphics would go in, all your vertexes, all your triangles would go at the beginning, it would go through certain processes, and at the other end, you would get the display. And the, how that pipeline worked, you could tweak some flags, you could do certain things, but basically it was a fixed pipeline. And then what happened is they came up with the idea of creating a programmable pipeline where the game designer could actually write the code that handles the vertexes and something that handles the pixels. So what came out of this was a, the idea of a programmable vertex shader and a programmable fragment shader. And we'll talk about both of those now. Now a vertex shader was programmable. The game designer could write some code that would handle each of those vertex operations. Now a vertex shader runs once per vertex on a 3D model. Now, after it's been down the pipeline, at some point, it's getting near to being pixels, getting near to being something that will be displayed on the screen. And therefore, you have a thing called the pixel shader or the fragment shader. Now, basically, the fragment shader decides the color, uh, the texture, uh, the lighting and the shadows that are being thrown by the different objects in the 3D world. So at one end, you have the 3D models with the vertexes, the vertex shader, and at the other end, just before you're about to put things onto the screen, you have a fragment shader which controls the color of each individual pixel. Now, the fragment shader runs once per pixel on the screen. Now, 3D purists amongst you will say, yes, Gary, it's a bit more complicated than that, and yes, it is, but I'm just trying to give here a basic overview of what's happening. Now, where CPUs and GPUs differ significantly is that the vertex shaders are pretty autonomous. They can run on each vertex independently, and in fact, it turns out the fragment shaders are fairly autonomous. Now, of course, there are some interlinking between these things, but basically, GPUs are very good at doing things in parallel. And therefore, you find that GPUs actually have multiple execution engines. In fact, what they call them is multiple shader cores, a shader that can run vertex work or fragment work. And if you look at an ARM Mali GPU, it's often the end of the name, like the ARM Mali T880, will have MP, something in MP4, MP12, and that number at the end tells you how many shader cores it has. Now, the more shader cores it has, the more work it can do in parallel. Now, because GPUs can do things in a parallel manner, it actually opens them up to a whole other area of technology called GPU computing. C GPU computing is when you have a task that needs to be done highly in parallel using 12 shader cores, for example. Now, it actually turns out that certain types of image processing, certain types of computer vision, and actually certain types of machine learning work very well on GPUs. And so all modern GPUs, both on the desktop and on the uh, mobile phone, support a kind of GPU computing, render script maybe, or OpenCL, which allows them to be used for these kinds of tasks. 
Now there's one other thing I want to mention, that is of course there is a difference between 3D graphics on a desktop and 3D graphics on a mobile phone. Of course, if you've seen a 3D graphics card from NVIDIA or from uh, ATI, AMD, they are, they are big. They've got big fans on them, they've got huge coolers on them, they need their own separate power supply. Sometimes they occupy two slots. You can have two of them in your car and your PC and so on. Now, of course, a mobile phone can't do that. I mean, the, the graphics cards themselves are bigger than most phones. So, of course, power efficiency is key when it comes to mobile GPUs. And that's why it's interesting that companies like Qualcomm and companies like ARM have actually seemed to be doing very well in the GPU market, but maybe Nvidia isn't doing so well because it hasn't been able to translate its desktop GPU technology down into the mobile. Whereas specifically designed mobile GPUs from say ARM are doing a much better job. Now, of course, the amazing thing is, is that we as consumers, we expect to see the greatest and the best 3D graphics we can on a mobile phone because we're used to seeing things on a console or on a desktop. And the amazing thing is that the GPU designers are managing to bring high levels of quality to a smartphone. Now, of course, you've always sensed it yourself when you've played a 3D game, the back of the phone does start to heat up a bit. And the reason for that is because of the parallel nature of the GPU. With a CPU, if you're doing something, some of the cores might shut down, it might be only running at a few megahertz. Now, while there are power saving things that go on inside a GPU, at that time when you're actually rendering those 3D frames, it wants to get them out there as fast as it can. So all the shaders are working, all of the stuff is going as quickly as it can so that it can produce those graphics for you. And of course it's doing that 60 frames a second. That means every 16 milliseconds it's processing a whole frame, including the work from the CPU and the GPU. And it's amazing that we can still actually get such great graphics from such a tiny piece of silicon and from such uh, with such great battery life. So hats off to all mobile GPU designers. You've definitely got my respect. Now in a minute I want to talk to you about the unified shader model and about the Vulkan API but before I do that please just if you like this video do give it a thumbs up also don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel. Now I said I'd mention the unified shader model. Now previously the vertex shader and the fragment shader were two specific different types of shader. If you look at say the Mali 470 GPU you can see that it has a vertex shader and up to four fragment shaders. What happened with OpenGL ES 3.0 and the equivalent in the DirectX world was that the shaders became unified. So any shader could become a vertex shader or a fragment shader. It could do both operations. And that's useful because if a shader was sitting idle because it had nothing to do because there wasn't any more vertex work to be done, it was a waste. But now if it can be a universal if it gets unified, if you can do any type of shading work, then your shaders can be employed to do all kinds of work and nothing ever has to sit idle. And of course, when it's not sitting idle, that means you get greater performance. Now, the latest thing that's happened in the 3D graphics world is the release of the Vulkan API. Now, basically, the Vulkan API comes after OpenGL. It's this new level that's being supported by just about everybody across the 3D graphics industry, and it's got two important improvements over the previous APIs. The first is that there's all the overheads for checking for errors has been reduced significantly because the idea is if you're writing a game, you need to find the errors while you're developing it, they don't need to be running while you're running the program itself. So they've been reduced, and that means that it's actually greater performance because the error checking has been reduced. The other thing is it plays very nicely with multi-core CPUs, which means that if two CPUs are trying to do two things to the graphics API at the same time, they can now do it at the same time. Previously, they'd have to wait one for the other. Now it's multi-core friendly. So you'll see that the Galaxy S7, for example, actually was the first mobile phone, Android mobile phone release that supported the Vulkan API. Okay, to sum up, 3D graphics are done using triangles. Triangles have three corners, three vertexes, and those three vertexes need to be transformed in size and in position into the 3D graphic world. And to do that, you use vectors, floating points, and four by four matrices. And a GPU is very good at doing those kinds of operations and very fast. 
Now, in modern day GPUs, you can program the vertex shader that runs once per vertex, every point on those triangles, and you can program the fragment shader, every pixel that appears on the screen to set the color. And what happens is the programmer writes the shaders, he writes the code that runs on the GPU to produce the final image. And as the 3D designers come up with more and more interesting ways of handling lights and shadows and textures and all these amazing things, you get better and better graphics. So the next time you play a 3D game on your mobile phone or even on your console or on your desktop, just give a thought to the GPU and all that hard work it's doing just so that you can enjoy your gaming experience. My name is Gary Sims from Android Authority and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, as I said earlier, please do give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel. Also, please come over to the Android Authority forums. There's a special section in there where you can talk to me about GPUs and CPUs and other Gary Explained videos that I have produced. I look forward to connecting with you there. Also, don't forget to download the Android Authority app so you can get access to all of our content directly on your mobile phone. And last but not least, don't forget to stay tuned to Android authority.com because we are your source for all things Android.